Hello, my friends. Welcome back. Hey, right from the start, I wanted to just take a quick moment and say that I truly appreciate your tenacity, your determination, your work ethic. I know this course has been a lot of content that has come at you very, very quickly. I wanted to give you some hope. This is the last lecture in Module 6. Next week is Module 7, our final module. So you're about to embark on your last lap. Uh, so I would encourage you to keep up the good work and finish strong. So today, Lecture 6.3, I'll focus on the order Chiroptera. The bats are the only mammal that is capable of true powered flight. So I'll begin with the flying foxes, in air quotes, in the family Pteropodidae, like this Rodriguez fruit bat on the top left. I'll discuss the Rhinolophidae, which are the horseshoe-nosed bats, like you see here. So that nose adornment, that's going to amplify reflected sound waves that this little bat detects using echolocation. Similarly here, the Jones round leaf bat in the family Hypsocidiridae uh, is a, obviously another family that's relying on echolocation. And so hopefully you remember that central tenet in biology, form fits function. Okay, so this structure is not random. <laughs> this structure has been sculpted by millions of years of evolution, and it's telling the astute biologist uh, that this is an echolocating bat. This is the aptly named mouse-tailed bat here in the family Rhinopomatidae. <laughs> this guy on the top right is the greater sack-winged bat in the family Embalornuridae. Um, so this family, this particular species, is known for their elaborate vocalizations. So the males are, are calling out and females are choosing their mates based on the calls. But what's really remarkable is that the baby greater sack wing bats babble just like human infants. So we'll come back to those guys. This is the northern ghost bat. Um, a white bat, also in the family uh, Embalornuridae. Hopefully I got that pronounced correctly. <laughs> um, this is a New World leaf-nosed bat. They're known for making tents by furling large leaves. They're from the family Phyllostomidae, Phyllostomidae, the New World leaf-nosed bats. And then we have the Wagner's mustached bat here from the family Mormupidae. And then lastly, one of my faves, the Mexican free-tailed bat. You can see that little tail hanging out past the Uropatagium. Uh, so the Mexican free-tailed bat is in the family Molossidae. So initially, the order Chiroptera was thought to be closely related to the order Dermoptera, the gliding Colugos, which makes sense based on morphology, but we know that convergent evolution uh, can make for tricky phylogenetic relationships. So the molecular evidence now squarely places the order Chiroptera in the super order that we've discussed, Lar Asia Theria. So the order Chiroptera is more closely related to the ungulates, which we'll talk about next week, as well as the carnivores and the pangolins. All right, I know this is 11 minutes, I recognize this, but this PBS Eon series is just so good. I am a big fan of this young lady. She does a really good job of breaking it down. 
So this video is going to explore the three competing hypotheses uh, put forth in an attempt to explain bat evolution. Was it flight first? Was it echolocation first? Or did both of these fundamental bat adaptations evolve simultaneously, concurrently? The last few minutes of this PBS EONS video that's embedded in Canvas is going to discuss that molecular evidence that places the order Chiroptera in the Lar Asia theria next to the ungulates, carnivores, and pangolins, and not next to the calugos and the primates. So, to ensure that you watch this, you will see a question from this material on your final. So take a few minutes and check it out, please. Bats are second only to the rodents in the number of recognized species in the order. Currently, there are 21 recognized extant families of bats, and we'll cover each of those today, encompassing almost 230 genera and close to 1,400 species, as cited by Bergen et al. 2018. In terms of feeding, reproduction, behavior, morphology, including the structural adaptations which allow bats to fly, bats are going to show a great degree of specialization. They also exhibit an impressive range in body size, from the tiny hog-nosed bat in Thailand, which weighs about two grams. And I'll show you a picture of this one. I like its other name. It's called the bumblebee bat as well. I think that's a, uh, a better fit. Um, but it, it will sit on the end of your, your finger. It weighs about two grams. Uh, all the way up to the largest chiropteran. This is the large flying fox. Of course, it's not a true fox, um, but these guys can weigh up to 2.5 pounds. That said, most bats are relatively small, weighing from just 10 to about 100 grams, and you can remember a gram is about a paper clip. And it makes sense that these bats have minimized their body mass because they're flying. Powered flight coupled with echolocation. That is to say, the ability of most bats to emit high frequency calls, um, sound waves that are going to emanate, bounce off of solid features in their environment to be reflected back towards them that these bats are able to detect and then navigate their environments with, including locating and capturing prey. So these two fundamental adaptations have allowed bats to become widely distributed and to fill many ecological niches. So most species of bats are insectivorous, taking insects in flight like this pallid bat uh, that looks like it's uh, secured a katydid, or they'll glean them from foliage. That little bumblebee bat uh, is known for grabbing spiders. Um, other bats are carnivorous. They're going to take small vertebrates like frogs, mice, and occasionally other bats. Um, so the larger ghost bats will, will prey on other bats. A few species are piscivorous, and we remember those are species that feed on fish. So I'll show you the greater bulldog bat again here in a few slides and its ability to scoop up fish. Many species of bats are nectivorous, consuming pollen and nectar from flowers, uh, with which the bat and the flower, the plant lineages have co-evolved such that the bats um, mouth, rostrum, and its tongue will fit into the long funnel of the flower like a key in a lock. An exquisite example of co-evolution. The fruit bats are frugivorous. And then, of course, we have the three species of vampire bats that feed exclusively on blood. 
different feeding adaptations can occur within a given family, within the same family. So for example, all of those feeding modes are seen in the New World leaf bats in the family Phyllostomidae. So very diverse family, very large family. These different feeding habits and foraging styles among bat species result in a great variety of head shapes and dentition and facial features, more variety than in any other mammalian order. So I know this is kind of a long lecture, but it's also kind of fun um, to see all of these amazing bat faces. It's just truly wild. Uh, but before we get into the different families, I want to stress the importance of bats in structuring communities. Um, so number one, they are major consumers of night flying insects, for which we should be grateful. So those Mexican free-tailed bats that are living in that culvert in Phoenix, they are eating tons of mosquitoes every night during the summer, for which we should be thankful. Further, uh, bat species are important pollinators of plants. So for example, here in the Sonoran Desert, our saguaro cacti are completely dependent upon the lesser long-nosed bat for sexual reproduction. They need these little guys to spread their pollen. If we lose the lesser long-nosed bat, then uh, we lose this keystone cactus in our ecosystem. And I just noticed a spelling mistake. The lesser long-nosed bar, <laughs> that should be a T. Sorry about that. So despite their ability to adapt to various environments, bat populations are often negatively impacted by environmental perturbations, both natural as well as human-induced. So as a result, many species of bats throughout the world are in danger of extinction through the loss of cave and riparian riverbank habitats. Um, so these are really important places that they need in order to thermoregulate. Exposure to pesticides, disease, and we're going to talk about white-nosed syndrome on the next slide, as well as human exploitation. So we'll also talk about the unsustainable harvest of some populations of those massive fruit bats, formerly known as the Mega Chiroptera when I was in mammalogy. White nose syndrome is something that you should be familiar with as a mammologist. So it's a disease that affects hibernating bats. It's caused by a fungus which sometimes looks like white fuzz on the bats faces. So on the areas where they have bare skin on their faces, um, you'll also see the spores on their wings. Uh, there's the wing shot right there. You can see the little pockets of this white fungus. Here it is under magnification. So white nose syndrome, um, this is why it got its name uh, right here. So the fungus grows in cold, dark, and damp places. Um, it attacks the bats, grows on them while they're hibernating, and they're in a relatively inactive metabolic state. As it grows, it's going to cause changes in the bat's behavior, making them become unnecessarily more active when they should be slowed way down, conserving energy and hibernation. So as they become active in response to this fungus, they burn up the fat, the brown fat that they need to survive the winter. Bats with white nose syndrome may do strange things like fly outside in the daytime in the middle of winter, right? Which is not when we should be seeing bats. So biologists first saw sick and dying bats from white nose syndrome in 2007 in caves near Albany, New York. So this X is ground zero. Uh, this map is provided by the USGS. However, cave explorers in that area had taken photos of bats with white powder on their noses the year before, so white nose syndrome has been in, the, in North America at least since 2006. But what's so disconcerting is how quickly it has spread from upstate New York and then the incredible mortality that some colonies see. 
So no matter how it got here, white nose syndrome continues to spread rapidly across the United States and Canada. It's killed millions of bats in North America. At some sites, 90 to 100 percent of the bats in the population in the colony have died. So the mortality rates can be awful. Several species are affected, with the hardest hit being the long-eared bat, the little brown bat, and the tri-colored bat. So it's in New Mexico, it's in West Texas, it looks like it's in Southern California. So if it isn't in Arizona already, it's very much likely soon to spread uh, to our state. So this is the novel white-nosed syndrome. It was likely vectored in uh, by us, perhaps by cavers. The spores are able to survive for long periods of time on surfaces. But so really all aspects of bat biology and natural history are associated with their ability to fly. So in comparison to birds, bats are relatively slow flyers, but they are highly maneuverable. So to comprehend how a bat flies, it's necessary to understand a few basic aerodynamic terms. First, a bat, just like a bird, just like an airplane, is able to fly because it generates enough lift to overcome the gravitational pull. Secondly, it's going to generate enough propulsive forward thrust to overcome the force of drag. So remember, drag is the resistance of the air as the bat moves through it, through this medium, okay? So the dorsal surface of the wing in bats is convex, and the ventral surface, the lower surface, is concave. And you can really see that here. Convex on the top, concave on the bottom. So that's going to cause the air to move more quickly over the top surface relative to the bottom surface, which is going to cause less air pressure up top because the particles are moving faster and more air pressure below. Greater pressure below is what's going to generate that lift. So generally, the greater the camber of the wing, that's the front to back curvature. So this is the front of the wing, and then this is the back of the wing. This one's got more camber. That's going to generate more lift. And then the greater the angle of attack. So the greater the angle, the more lift can be generated. This is some really nice biomimicry research being done using a robotic bat wing. It's amazing how much <laughs> this looks like a real bat. Um, but the engineers are using it to better understand how we can build more efficient aircraft as well as highly maneuverable micro vehicles. So it's only one minute. It's out of Brown University. Check it out. As with flight, echolocation has shaped the evolution of life histories of the vast majority of bat species. Although, I will point out the pteropodids, the flying foxes, they do not use echolocation. In short, to find prey items and maneuver within their environment, most bats echolocate. That is, they're going to emit high frequency sound pulses, and they're going to do it from different places, and we'll cover some of that, um, to discern information about objects in their path um, by the returning echoes uh, from the sound waves bouncing back at them. Many of the structural characteristics of bats, including their seemingly bizarre facial features, relate to echolocation. 
So as you would expect, many aspects of echolocation are species specific, and they're gonna relate to the specific types of prey that they're after. So this is a really nice synopsis that will clearly explain echolocation at an appropriate depth for this class. So be sure and watch this carefully. Historically, bats were grouped into two suborders, the mega chiroptera and the micro chiroptera. The mega chiroptera included the old world fruit bats, the flying foxes, the pteropodidae, and then the micro chiroptera encompassed all the other families. So given the names mega and micro, it was obviously primarily based on size. However, there are a number of other morphological differences that really separate the pteropodids, um, the old world fruit bats, uh, which I just mentioned. For one, they, they do not echolocate. However, recent phylogenetic work on large molecular data sets of both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA now uh, breaks out the bats into two suborders but splits them a bit differently. So the two accepted suborders within the order Chiroptera are the yin tero Chiroptera on top and if there's a yin, there must be a yang, the yango chiroptera here on the bottom. The yin tero chiroptera includes the tera potidae, the old world fruit bats, but it's now also going to include six families <clears throat> of echolocating bats lumped in here, okay? Um, the superorder Yango chiroptera encompasses 14 families of echolocating bats, uh, grouped into three superfamilies. So, as with the rodents, there are just so many bat families that you will not be responsible for suborders or superfamilies. I'm not going to test you over uh, these taxonomic levels. Uh, on your final exam, you will, however, be aligning bat common names with associated photographs to the appropriate taxonomic family, okay? That said, I am not going to choose, uh, you know, obscure families uh, with one species in them from Madagascar, right? I'm going to select uh, families, large families with well-known species. So families like the Phyllostomidae here. This is a very large family. This is the New World leaf bats. So you should know that one. All right, so we'll begin with the first suborder, the Yen Pterochiroptera, and we'll start with the family Pteropodidae, uh, this large assemblage of 45 genera and close to 200 species of old world fruit bats. They're distributed south and east of the Sahara Desert and Africa, throughout India, Southeast Asia, and Australia, even on the Caroline and the Cook Islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Wingspans on some of these uh, flying foxes may reach two meters. That's six foot wingspan across. So that is a very large bat. No wonder they called them flying foxes, huh? So as I've mentioned numerous times now, pteropodids do not echolocate. It's probably a good test question. Um, instead of echolocation, they have very large um, eyes right here. Um, they have relatively simple ears, and they don't have any of those distinctive facial adornments that are associated with echolocation. They're navigating primarily using vision, and anatomically, their large eyes are unusual. Your book talks a bit about them, um, but interesting to me, um, most of the photoreceptors are rod cells for black and white vision, uh, light intensity, but there are some cone cells for color vision in some species. Um, remember, most mammals are bichromatic. Um, we have some additional cone cells in some of these fruit bats, um, some of which are diurnal and looking for ripe fruit. 
Although some fruit bats are diurnal, uh, the vast majority of them are primarily nocturnal, active at night, uh, like their chiropteran uh, brethren. This is interesting. So large species of these flying foxes can fly upwards of 100 kilometers. So that's 60 miles between their roosting trees and their foraging areas. That's a long way to go to get to those mangoes. It's important to recognize that these fruit bats, these pteropodids, serve valuable ecological functions in these ecological communities, both as pollinators and then perhaps most importantly as seed dispersers. So the fruit bats have entered into a mutualistic relationship, a plus-plus relationship with the fruit-bearing trees. Fruit bearing trees are going to produce this sweet, high caloric food for the fruit bat, and in exchange, that fruit bat is going to fly upwards of 60 miles and deposit those seeds. Remember, trees and plants have to get their seeds away from their overstory, away from themselves, or else they shade out their own young. So they're going to rely on uh, mobile uh, mammals, oftentimes, uh, volant. <laughs> flying bats to spread those seeds. The seeds are spit out while they're flying or the seeds are going to pass through the bat's gastrointestinal tract to be deposited along with a bit of fertilizer. So in Africa and on many islands in the South Pacific, uh, bats are faced with the loss of roosting and foraging habitats and then they're harvested as food. Um, and in some cases, some of these harvests have severely reduced bat populations. So uh, many moons ago, my old colleagues from the University of Montana, Sam and Tammy Mildenstein, worked on this very issue as Peace Corps volunteers in the Philippines in the late 90s. So one of the big problems I remember from their presentation is that historically indigenous people would harvest these bats using projectiles but many of these hunters were now armed with modern shotguns which are just all too efficient at shooting bats out of roost trees. So four species of pteropodids have become extinct recently, including the Palau Island flying fox. Palau is one of those places I would love to visit. The Guam flying fox. Of course, Guam is a U.S. territory. The Percy Island flying fox and the lesser Massarine flying fox. So this is just so beautiful. Uh, it shows how a mom is adjusting her behavior to thermoregulate for her infant. Initially, she's holding it tight, wrapped within her wings to keep it warm. But then as it warms up, she's going to begin fanning her baby um, to cool it off. So this is only a minute. Uh, please check it out. You'll appreciate it. Horseshoe bats are widely distributed throughout Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, Japan, the East Indies, and Northern Australia. They're named for this distinctive facial ornamentation, this horseshoe, which includes uh, a leaf nose here um, above the nostrils. The nostrils are right in here. So we've got this leaf-shaped nose. And then on the sides, we have these flaps of skin that are shaped like a horseshoe. So this nose ornamentation functions in directing uh, those sound waves, those pulses, which are initially emitted by the nostrils. So most bats are going to emit those high frequency pulses from their mouths, the horseshoe bats emitting them from their nostrils. Um, but the reflected sound waves are funneled in to uh, the bat using um, these nose ornaments. So the primary prey of the horseshoe bats are small moths and beetles. This species, pictured here, doesn't even have a scientific name that I can find. Um, it's not fully described. It was just discovered in 2019. So still lots of really good field work to be done out there, folks. 
Closely related to those horseshoe bats is the family Hippocideridae, which includes seven genera and about 88 species of old world leaf-nosed and round leaf bats. So this family is widely distributed throughout the old world, throughout Asia, the East Indies, Australia, Africa, and the Middle East where they're going to take advantage of a diverse array of prey, primarily beetles, moths, and flies um, that they're catching on the wing with that superb echolocation. So one look at this bat on your final assessment and you're going to recognize that it is clearly navigating using echolocation, um, form fits function. These structures are funneling the sound waves into the bat much the way that the ears are going to funnel sound waves into the middle and inner ear. Another family of insectivorous echolocators with cool facial ornamentation are the aptly named trident bats. So you remember the trident that Poseidon had? Um, so the family Rhinonycteridae includes four extant genera and six species of trident bats. So they're going to share many of the same characteristics as the leaf-nosed and horseshoe bats that we just covered. This family, the Megadermatidae, contains five genera and six species of false vampire bats. So this common name is going to reflect the historical but false belief uh, that these bats feed on blood. The megadermatids are found in tropical and savanna habitats throughout Central Africa, India, Southeast Asia, the East Indies, and Australia. These bats can be quite large. Um, so the Australian giant false vampire bat or the ghost bat uh, shown here has a wingspan of two feet and it's going to feed on small vertebrates including lizards, rodents, small birds, and even other bats. Um, so a carnivorous ghost bat. So this family is monotypic and it includes that species that I talked about on the first slide, the hog-nosed or the bumblebee bat, which actually wasn't discovered until 1973 and uh, is very restricted in its range. It's known from only 35 caves in Kanchanaburi province in western Thailand and from eight caves in southeast Myanmar. Uh, or Burma. So this is one of the, this is the smallest species of bat and based on body mass one of the smallest mammalian species in the world. So head and body length is only about 30 millimeters which is just over an inch long. Um, body mass is about two grams, about two paper clips. And uh, as I think I mentioned before, spiders are apparently the bumblebee bat's favorite food. The family Rhinopomatidae is composed of the mouse-tailed bats, which are named for their long tails, which you don't see all that often on bats. Um, the tails are nearly equal in length to both the head and the body. All mouse-tailed bats are grouped into just a single genus, which contains four species found throughout North Africa, the Middle East, as well as India and Sumatra. These are insectivorous bats that occur in arid regions where they're going to uh, roost in caves, under cliffs, even in houses and the Egyptian pyramids. So if you see bats flitting around the Great Pyramids in Egypt, uh, chances are good that you're looking at a mouse-tailed bat. Moving on to that second suborder, we're making good progress. This is the yang o Chiroptera. So we'll start with the family Imbaloneuridae, which is comprised of 14 genera and about 54 species of sac-winged or sheath-tailed bats. 
So this family is going to enjoy a widespread distribution in tropical and subtropical habitats from Mexico to Brazil here in the Western Hemisphere, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, India, Southeast Asia, Australia, and Pacific Islands, um, all the way to Samoa. So they are all over the world. They're known as sheath-tailed bats because the tail is not going to extend beyond the uropatagium. So that's the flap of skin um, at the um, posterior end of the bat. And your book has a nice figure that's going to show uh, the variability that we see in uh, the uropatagium across bat families. So tail doesn't extend beyond that like it does in the free-tailed bats, which we'll cover here shortly. Um, they're also called sac-winged bats because of glandular wing sacs that are on the ventral surface of the wings. That's the underside uh, near the elbow. These sacs are most prominent in males, and they're going to exude a red odiferous substance that is important uh, in pheromone production and the attraction of females. So remember, it's that whole olfactory communication thing going on with mammals. The sac wing bats are also known for their complex auditory vocalization. So there's an insert in your book that talks about this, but in short, males are territorial and they're going to produce these complex songs that are going to advertise to females the quality of their uh, of that male as a potential mate. And we're going to talk about sexual selection in our next and final module. So, but what's so interesting about this species, uh, as I kind of touched on on the first slide, the young males are going to imitate the older males, and initially they're going to start by bop, 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 babbling, much the way human infants do. So, if I have any parents out there, um, you surely remembered uh, when your newborn started making uh, vocalizations, started babbling. But that's how language begins to form. We begin by imitating those basic sounds. So, put me on pause and check out. Um, Ba baby bats babble much like human infants. The family Nycteridae is comprised of just a single genus with 16 species of slit-faced bats. So 14 of those 16 species are in sub-Saharan Africa and Madagascar, and then the other two species are in Malaysia and Indonesia. Nycterids can inhabit a diversity of ecosystems ranging from semi-arid areas, uh, savannas, to humid tropical rainforests. They can be solitary or they can roost together in colonies, in caves, trees, houses, even animal burrows. The reason why they're called slit-faced bats is because they have this unusual longitudinal groove that's going to run throughout their facial region. So that, coupled with the nose leaf, is going to function in their low-intensity echolocation calls that are also emitted through the nostrils. And then finally, the very large family, the Phyllostomidae. So these are the New World leaf-nosed bats. And I hope you understand by New World, I mean North, Central, and South America. So the New World leaf-nosed bats are comprised of 62 genera and as many as 214 species. As your book points out, dozens of new species of New World leaf-nosed bats have been described in just the past couple of decades. So this is a very common species that lives here in the Sonoran Desert. This is the California leaf-nosed bats. So phyllostomans are widely distributed from here in the southwestern United States down through Central America, across the Caribbean, and northern South America. They're, they occur in habitats from sea level all the way up to high elevation, ranging in, in habitats from deserts like the Sonoran, Mojave, uh, Chihuahuan, uh, to tropical rainforests. 
The nose leaf ornamentation is present in most genera. You can see it here on the California leaf-nosed bat, but it's not as pronounced as the old world leaf-nosed bats. So phylostomids exhibit unparalleled variety in terms of their feeding habits. Uh, in fact, there are probably more feeding modes within this family than in any other mammalian family. So smaller species of New World leaf-nosed bats are primarily insectivorous. Larger species tend to be carnivorous, feeding on small vertebrates. Some leaf-nosed bats are primarily nectivorous. Uh, feeding on nectar, pollen, and we have frugivorous ones as well. And then, of course, we have the three species of true vampire bats, which are sanguinivorous, as we've previously discussed. Vampire bats are going to regurgitate blood for one another. And the females are going to share this regurgitated, these regurgitated blood meals with both family as well as non-relatives. So it's easy to understand why a bat might share her meal with her daughter or her niece. Um, there's that kin relationship. Their survival means that her family's genes are more likely to be propagated into future generations. But why are female bats, vampire bats, helping other members of their colonies that they're not closely related to that are not their kin. Well, it turns out that vampire bats maintain friendships just like we do. So this is a short um, but engaging read for your module six current event connection. Um, so it's entitled Blood Sisters, What Vampire Bats Can Teach Us About Friendship. With respect to phylostomid conservation, the Puerto Rican flower bat and the giant vampire bat are both recently extinct. I looked it up, apparently the giant vampire bat was about 30% larger than the extant common vampire bat that we know and love. Uh, the giant vampire bat had a wingspan of about 20 inches, so almost two feet. Um, this is the Jamaican flower bat. Um, doesn't have a lot of pigment in its hair. Um, there's only about 250 Jamaican flower bats left. Um, let's see, uh, other species that are in trouble, uh, multiple species of New World flying foxes um, that of course are uh, phylostomids, meaning they're New World leaf-nosed bats. The family Moore Moopidae has two genera and 17 species with common names such as the mustached, the ghost-faced, or the naked-backed bats. This is the Peter's ghost-faced bat. Its head looks a bit like a satellite dish for receiving those sound wave signals. So more, more moopids occur in semi-arid to tropical forest habitats from the southwestern United States through Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean to northern South America. Members of the family Noctilionidae are known as the bulldog or the fishing bats. There's just one genus, two extant species of fishing bats, uh, both found in tropical lowlands from northern Mexico to northern Argentina and on several Caribbean islands. So I hope you remember the greater bulldog bat. I've shown you some pictures um, of this species before. This is a piscivorous species, a fish-eating species that hunts at night and uses those very long hind legs and those rake-like feet uh, with well-developed claws to scoop up small fish, crustaceans, and aquatic insects. Most amazingly, the prey is detected through echolocation near the surface of the water. And they're hunting in both fresh 
as well as salt water. <laughs> All right, some amazing footage, an amazing footage alert right here. Check out how accurate these fishing bats are at hunting at night using echolocation. The fur Ipetiridae are called the smoky bats or the thumbless bats because the digit here is so small and enclosed within the wing membrane that it appears to be absent. So the thumbless bats. So these guys are cool. The family Thyroteridae is comprised of five species of disc-winged bats in just a single genus. Their thumbs have also been modified, but this time they've been modified into round concave suction cup discs. So the discs are used, as you can see here, to cling to stems and leaves and other smooth surfaces. A single disc is capable of supporting the individual's entire body mass. <laughs> so this is an extremely unusual family. So the Mysta cynidae, it's a small family that's endemic to the island of New Zealand. They're called short-tailed bats. There's only two species in one genus. They live in old growth tropical rainforests and the short-tailed bats have several morphological adaptations for terrestrial locomotion and hunting on the ground. So first off, look at these talons. So that is a claw on the bat. They have very sharp claws on their hind feet and then their thumb has this talon. And then when an individual is not flying, the wings are folded up tight like a sail uh, against the arms, which is gonna make this bat very agile, moving and hunting on the ground. <laughs> not only do these uh, two species have talons and run around on the ground, but they are the only species of bat known to burrow. So they are going to dig burrows using their upper incisors to excavate the holes. Very cool. The family Mysopodidae now contains two species of sucker-footed bats from Madagascar. Uh, similar structure as the disc wing bats that I just showed you. This species lives right here in Arizona. It's one of my favorites. The Townsend's Big-Eared Bat. Boy, you think it's got a cute hearing, huh? Uh, it's a member of the Vesper Tilionidae. So this is another really large family. This is the largest bat family. It has 54 genera and 493 species worldwide. So I can assure you, you're going to see this family on your final assessment. The Vesper Tilionidae um, includes the Townsend's big-eared bat so these guys are found worldwide. It's a huge family, tropical, temperate, and desert habitats. They're only absent from polar areas, high elevation areas, and a handful of oceanic islands. Most species uh, within the family Vesper tilionidae are insectivorous, but because insects are unavailable during the winter, species that live in temperate regions are either going to have to migrate or hibernate because they're not going to get enough energy for those high metabolic rates. The family Minioteridae are the long-winged or the bent-winged bats grouped into a single genus and include 19 to maybe as many as 35 species depending upon if you're a lumper or a splitter. So this is a very, very rare family. Um, it contains only two species, the Angolan and the Lassures hairy bat. And this was the only uh, uh, certifiable picture uh, that I could find of either of these two species uh, that we don't really know that much about from Southern Africa. 
The family Molossidae is comprised of 19 genera and approximately 122 species of free-tailed bats. So they're distributed worldwide from southern Europe, Africa, Asia, and Australia, all the way out to the island of Fiji. In the New World, free-tailed bats occur from southwestern Canada, throughout the United States, and the Caribbean, down to Central and South America. Molossids are fast-flying aerial insectivores that occur in habitats from forests to deserts. The family name derives from the Greek word molossus, or the mastiff, which is a reference to the general dog-like snout of these bats. So this is the naked bulldog bat. Um, you can see this is unusual because its hair is very short and very sparse. Um, so clearly lives in the tropics and warmer habitats. As I've discussed, the free-tailed bats form the largest aggregations of any species of mammal. Another good test question. Um, so the largest colony uh, of Mexican free-tailed bats is about 20 million individuals uh, reported uh, from a single cave in central Texas. I've seen them streaming out of Carlsbad Cavern in New Mexico. It is a spectacle. It is awesome. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. As I told you about in lecture 3.3, Phoenix has its own bat cave. So, well, it's a culvert, a tunnel, but it's filled with Mexican free-tailed bats that you can go and observe during the summer months. So you should go and make a night of it. Our final family, the Natalidae, contains 11 or 12 species of funnel-eared bats that occur from northern Mexico to northern South America and on many Caribbean islands. Adult males have an unusual mass of glandular sensory organs called the natalid organ below the skin on the forehead. The wings are long and slim and natalids have an erratic butterfly-like flight as they consume insects. This species is from uh, Cuba. And with that, uh, just three Chiropteran references. Pat yourselves on the back. Give yourselves a round of applause. You have finished module six. Six modules down, just one more to go. Just one more week, um, one and a half weeks actually. Um, so I'll see you back here next week. Thank you so much for your time. Cheers.